Okay, so it's now free past. Um, and I would uh, now officially start um, by uh, introducing uh, today's wonderful speaker. So good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are based currently uh, 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 to this webinar. My name is Leonie Tatzer. I'm a lecturer at UCL, and I'm also um, the principal investigator of a project called Gender and IoT, which looks at technology facilitated abuse in the context of domestic violence and abuse. And it's therefore absolutely exciting to have uh, Eva Pensey Mook today with us, who is one of the leading voices in this field and most recently has uh, also published a book on this uh, uh, important topic called uh, Design for Safety, um, which is a link I will share in a, in a few seconds as well. And Eva is a user experience and digital safety designer, and she's also the founder of the Inclusive Safety Project, which exactly looks at this topic and tries to actually bring this uh, issue forward in the tech sector and tries to make designers of technologies better aware of how their systems could potentially cause harms to some of the most vulnerable groups in society. And this new book, Design for Safety, is one of the core topics of today because uh, it, it, I highly recommend everyone reading it because it like lays out some of the key design features technologists can have and should have on their radar when they uh, develop products and services. And so uh, I will, the, the structure of today's webinar will basically be, um, if I will take around 40, 45 minutes to present uh, the key points that she has de de presented for today's seminar, um, and, and will hopefully leads us then to a nice Q&A session where we can discuss some of this issue and bring them all to, back together, for example, on your own experiences or your research um, that you're doing or the practice uh, that you experience on the front line, for example. So we will, you, there is a dedicated Q&A box. So if you could share all your questions there, and there's also the chat function so you can like connect with other participants, which I will monitor very closely. Um, Feel free to tweet and, and share information on Twitter as well. And feel free to also engage with us. And uh, just to say, the, we will address all the questions at the end of the session, but please feel free to put them down as we go along. And I guess with that long intro, I actually want to hand over then to Eva Penzimuk, who really is so kind to share her insights today with all of us. So Eva, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Leonie. Um, yeah, really excited to be here. I really I've like followed this program, um, the state program for a while. It's really cool. I always think if I were to go back to school, it would definitely be this program. And Leonie is also a leading, I mean, I'm sure everyone here knows she's also a leading person in this space and uh, is quoted in my book um, a couple of times with her work on IoT and gender violence. So, um, which is also something I'm gonna talk a little bit about today, um, but very grateful for her work on that front and how it's informed my work. Um, Cool, so I am going to share my screen. Um, and I do, and I'll just say quickly too, that this presentation, um, so key key considerations for designing against, or for designing for safety um, is sort of a little more aimed at like people working in tech and um, there are some practical things about like what we can do about this, about these different things and things to consider. And I know that just seeing a lot of people here um, introducing themselves in the chat that there's a lot of people sort of from the academic space um, which is really awesome. So just saying like there's sort of a mixed group and um, all of this may not be applicable to you, but hopefully you still get something out of the different things anyway. Um, so with all that said, share my screen and start my presentation. So yeah, so this is Designing for Safety Key Considerations. Like Leonie said, um, my name is Eva. I'm the author of Design for Safety, which is just came out in August. Um, I'm also a principal designer at a software consultancy called Aceflight, which actually has an office in London, um, and my pronouns are she and her. So um, trigger warning, going to talk about some explicit uh, instances of domestic violence, elder abuse, and child abuse. Obviously, like cameras are, I can't see anyone, um, so if at any point you just need to like step away, please take care of yourself. Uh, so for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to talk, um, give a brief overview of what it means to design for safety, go through the key considerations, which will be the bulk of this uh, presentation. I'll talk briefly about integrating some of this stuff into your actual work, um, thinking about when you design tech, um, and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions. 
So uh, in a nutshell, designing for safety means doing realistic assessments of how your product facilitates interpersonal harm, such as domestic violence, elder abuse, and child abuse, and then preventing and mitigating that harm. So that's what I'm talking about when I, when I say safety. I'm specifically talking about interpersonal harm. Obviously, there's a lot more uh, to do with tech safety, and this is just sort of one aspect of it that I focus on. Uh, designing for safety also means prioritizing the goals of your most vulnerable users while working against the goals of users who seek to weaponize your product for harm. And this is sort of different from like typical sort of design like philosophy or the way that we think of user experience design in our work. Um, we're typically identifying user goals and then thinking about how we can help them meet those goals. But I think designing for safety, we have to we have to actually be thinking about certain goals that we don't want people to be able to accomplish and preventing them, which is sort of a, a shift in thinking for lots of people. Before I get into this, uh, I want to have a quick note on something called checkbox frameworks. So a checkbox framework is sort of um, exactly what it sounds like. You know, it's sort of a list of things to think about as you're, you know, designing or building tech. Um, and it's very straightforward and simple, and you can kind of just go down the list and say like, yep, yep did all these things. Um, and, you know, obviously it's, it's always good to be doing something. I think a checkbox framework is better than nothing, but I do want to just note that um, when you simply check things off a list, you risk not really learning more about the issue and really internalizing it. Um, and I think probably this is like the opposite for most people here who are from like an academic background. Um, it's totally different. You are much better uh, at like learning about the issue and really internalizing it and um, thinking very critically about all the things. Whereas a lot of people who are sort of working in the actual tech space um, might do less of that and kind of jump to like, okay, so what, what do I have to do? Like, what does this mean for me and my work? And a checkbox framework can be very appealing because it's very simple and straightforward. And then you can kind of rest assured that you've done all the things. Um, but unfortunately, it's never actually that simple. Um, and we need to sort of resist the urge to go right into action um, and realize that it's okay to sit with discomfort and to have to kind of take some time to learn some things before we rush into action. Um, and I think safety is part of a continuous learning journey. So um, I, I think of it similar to um, security where, you know, companies have security experts working for them, security teams doing things. And that's never something that you're sort of done with. There's no point where a security team is like, okay, we have, we have done all the things. We're good now. Like we can quit our jobs and go home because this product or this database or whatever it is, is now secure. Um, that's not really a thing. There's always new things that are happening that they have to respond to and learn about. And I think of safety as that sort of a continuous learning journey that you're always going to be going on. Um, and I bring this all up because the presentation I'm about to give is going to feel kind of like a checkbox framework because I'm going to just sort of go through like the sort of very high level like key points um, with all of this. But there is actually like a lot more going on under the surface. Um, my book has like a lot more um, examples and sort of in-depth things to think about. Um, so I just wanna kind of give this all as a big caveat to this talk I'm about to do. Okay, so we're gonna get into the key considerations. Um, and I actually wanna start with a story that is um, less about having an active abuser who wants to do harm and more about how tech uh, can harm people in a sort of passive way and how, you know, this is a story about about the harm happening because we're not considering vulnerable groups. Um, even if we don't aim to actually hurt them, we can still often hurt them. Um, and all these stories, by the way, are sort of taken from either my research or different like news articles and obviously needs to be changed in details and whatnot for anonymity. Um, so this is Victoria. She is a trans woman who recently started a new job as a developer at a big tech company. Um, She's told her boss about her gender identity and she kind of figures she'll be telling her friends as she makes them. It's not something she's about to you know, get on Slack and shout about day one, it's very personal. Um, she does all of her onboarding from the human resources department on her first day. And part of that is a demographic survey. She chooses trans woman as her gender identity uh, and doesn't think too much about it. And a few weeks later, she's at a quarterly meeting with the rest of her company and the HR team goes over the demographic survey, which they do twice a year. 
and it happens that uh, this is the time of the year when they're going to go through it. Um, it includes a data point that the company has one person who identifies as trans. And this is a new data point since the last time that the information was shared. And Victoria is the only new employee. So she's essentially just been outed by this demographic survey. So the first issue that I wanna bring up is this idea of um, control of our data. Um, who gets to control our personal data? How are users informed about how their data is going to be used? Because a lot of times people aren't fully aware about how things are going to be used. And this is, there are so many different examples of this, of, especially when it comes to like, you know, the ability to scrape data and use it in other ways that the person hasn't necessarily agreed to, but making sure that people understand exactly how their data will be used. And then also thinking about what happens to personal data when a user leaves a product or service, or, you know, Victoria, if she were to leave this company, uh, what would happen to the data that she had given while she was there? Does she have control of it? Can it can it be gotten rid of? Um, could she go back and change something later? Um, so thinking through all these things is uh, the first issue in terms of designing for safety. All right, now I'm gonna get into more of the sort of interpersonal harm thing that I focus on where it's people with interpersonal relationships with each other using tech to harm each other. Um, so this is a story about Rob who is a uh, senior at university and he lives with three different flatmates on a house near campus. Uh, Nathan is his roommate and he's really into smart home devices. And he's got a bunch of different things. He's got smart lights, smart lock, a nest, thermostat. And he sets all this stuff up the day that uh, him and his roommates all move in together. Nathan starts to mess with his roommates using uh, the different smart home devices. But after he gets into an argument with Rob about dirty dishes, he starts to really target Rob more and more. Uh, Rob will be trying to cook in the kitchen, for example, and Nathan will turn out the lights from the other room. And he does this over and over again. Rob's able to just turn on the lights because he has the app and there's a light switch if he didn't. Uh, so he's able to sort of fix the problem, but it's still really frustrating. And he tells Nathan that it's not funny anymore, but he keeps doing it. Later on, Rob and Nathan disagree about the temperature. Rob is really hot, but Nathan thinks it's comfortable and he doesn't want to turn the temperature down and get cold um, and have to put on a sweater. And I realize now that this is in Fahrenheit, um, I feel like people usually know this stuff, um, but 72 is like a warm, like normal temperature. Um, anyway, the two use their Nest apps uh, to continuously change the temperature one after the other over the course of a few hours until Nathan just removes Rob from the account so that he no longer has access to the nest from his app. He starts turning the heat up to 90 degrees, which is really, really hot as a joke. Uh, this causes Rob to have to come out of his room and change the temperature on the nest manually since he doesn't have the app anymore and he can't access it digitally. Finally, he gets fed up and decides he's just gonna leave and go study in a library. And when he comes back, the key code for the smart lock on the front door doesn't work. He puts it in over and over again, but it just won't unlock. And finally, he starts pounding on the door in frustration and Nathan lets him in and they talk about it and Nathan insists that he just isn't using the device correctly. Rob feels like all this joking around has turned into something worse, something akin to bullying, but he's not really sure what he can do about it. So this is all you know, very familiar to people who study under Leone, but thinking about the different harms that can come with Internet of Things devices is really important um, because this is an emerging harm that we know is becoming more and more common. Um, definitely in the US, this is something that domestic violence advocates have reported is um, becoming a really big problem where people are asking uh, for help getting control of Internet of Things devices, advocates who work with uh, domestic violence survivors are asking for legal help with things like um, including IoT devices in a restraining order and how to sort of legally define it as a form of contact. Um, so we know that this is a big problem and as IoT devices get cheaper and easier to use, it's just going to continue to escalate. So if for anyone who works in this sort of IoT space, um, thinking about is a survivor able to quickly identify what's happening and how it's happening. So with Rob and Nathan, you know, Rob Rob knew very clearly exactly what was going on, but a lot of times it's it's not it's not clear. You know, you might not actually know why are the lights turning off. 
um, is someone else doing this or not? And it's very easy to sort of gaslight people and say, oh, of course I'm not doing that. Like, oh, spooky. Like maybe there's something else going on and sort of um, harass people that way. And then thinking about, is the survivor able to regain control of the device in a domestic violence context? Um, would they be able to easily like kick out a different user who had left the home? Um, and then thinking about if there's a fallback for people who are intentionally excluded the way that Rob was. So he was able to still turn on the lights and use the Nest thermostat because there were these sort of fallbacks uh, when he wasn't able to use the app, but there was no fallback for the smart lock. Um, and there was no way that he could get in until someone let him in. And I feel like, uh, you know, most IoT devices, it's pretty important that there's some sort of fallback for people who are in these situations. And it's not just when there's, you know, abuse happening, but um, maybe you legitimately forgot um, the code and then, but there's still a key like under a doormat or something like that. It's, there's all sorts of reasons why you might want physical fallbacks and I think IoT devices should have them. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next story. This is about Helen and Isaac. They are a recently married couple who have opened up a shared bank account. And the only problem is that while their bank account is totally shared, including separate logins, um, the banker who set this up actually made Isaac as a sort of primary account person, meaning that it's his information that gets used on the verification quiz that shows up when certain issues arise flagging a security issue. And this can be as mundane as like logging onto the account from a new device or a new Wi-Fi network for the first time. So this is an example of the verification quiz. Uh, and this is what Helen sees whenever she logs in, um, like I said, from a new Wi-Fi network or a new device. Um, that has, it has questions like, which number goes with your address on this street? And there's a bunch of different house numbers. Um, and these are actually very effective security questions. They're just from publicly uh, available data about different people. Uh, and even if you know it's someone that you've been with uh, together for a long time, a lot of these questions are gonna be hard to answer. Usually uh, you can answer some of them, but something like a number that goes with a street address from when a street that they lived on when they were a little kid, uh, that's gonna be very effective at keeping even a spouse out. So this means that uh, she has to ask Isaac for answers to these questions, which gives him a lot more power over their finances. And eventually Isaac uses that power to cut off Helen from their shared account. He withdraws cash for her to use and he's essentially giving her an allowance. This type of financial abuse is extremely common in domestic violence contexts. Uh, studies have found that overnight, like 99% of, of abusers will have some sort of um, financial control over a survivor. And too often bank accounts aren't fully shared or there's some sort of little, little way where actually one user is being privileged over another and that makes it that much easier for this financial abuse to happen. So thinking about shared accounts, there's a couple of things uh, to be aware of. Um, does one user actually have more power, which we saw in this example that one person did? Um, and is that power imbalance transparent or opaque? So in this situation, you know, they never, they never told Helen. And, it, and this is a common thing that I've heard from a lot of people in this specific scenario where people notice that these uh, identity verification questions are about their spouse or the person that, who, uh, that they have the account with. Um, it was never made clear that this is going to happen. Sometimes these types of things are unavoidable. I think in this case with banks, I've never actually been able to figure it out. I've done a lot of research, but I think there's probably some sort of law somewhere, or there's some sort of really intense data structure, or there's some reason why this has to happen. Um, and I think in this case, it at least needs to be transparent that this is going on because then people who are in a domestic violence context or some sort of vulnerable situation can at least know that this is gonna be happening and they can plan for it. And then finally thinking, does the user with less power then have a clear path towards gaining control over the account or getting some power back? So thinking about things like having um, just a customer service, having an actual phone number that someone can call to talk with an actual human being who can understand um, all of the different context and nuance of a situation like this in a way that a chat bot cannot and a, a FAQ on a website certainly cannot either. Okay, so this next story is about Owen. Um, he is a 
young boy, preteen, who is overall happy and well-adjusted, um, but his parents, like many parents, are just extremely concerned um, about his safety, and they choose to surveil him in a couple different ways. Um, they also happen to be part of a very conservative church, and they want to make sure that their son isn't looking at certain things online that they don't approve of, which includes a lot of things that are not blocked by traditional uh, child safe filters. And this is all very well intentioned, but it has some different problems. So first, Owen is growing up knowing that an adult is always watching. And while this wasn't such a big deal when he was younger, now that he's getting into his preteen years, he's starting to resent the omnipresence of his parents. His mom will call him after school and say things like, hey, you need to do a better job of putting your shoes and coat away and get started on your homework. Or if he goes to a friend's house and they go on a bike ride, she'll call him and ask why he's not still at the friend's house and where they're going. He's recently had a fight with her about the camera that's in his bedroom. He's becoming more aware of his body and he doesn't want anyone watching while he gets dressed in the morning. And his mom has promised that that's not happening, but he's still regularly putting up items in front of the camera in order to have some privacy. And we know, uh, you know researchers on child development have told us that some level of privacy during these years is extremely important for the development of older kids and especially teenagers. And the researchers have documented a lot of the negative impacts of not being able to have space to fully explore and develop outside of the watchful eyes of parents. And the over surveillance of kids is definitely a big factor in all of this. The other issue with this is that Owen doesn't know that his parents have recently installed monitoring software on his phone and laptop. So they're able to see basically everything he does, including search terms that he's been looking up more and more because Owen is beginning to realize that he might be gay or that he at least doesn't seem to think about girls the way that most of his friends do. He started looking up articles online to try to help himself figure it out. He has no idea that his parents can see all this. Um, like I said, they're part of a conservative church and he knows that they definitely won't approve of him being gay. So he wants to figure out all of this in secret and know for sure before talking to them about it. And this is a big safety concern um, because in the US there was a study by the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force Policy Institute and the National Coalition for the Homeless. For the homeless. And they found that um, LGBTQ plus youth experience homelessness at a very disproportionate rate. Um, they found that 50% of gay teens receive a negative impact from parents when they come out and that 26% are kicked out of their homes. So that's you know, over a quarter of kids in the US who come out as gay to their parents are then kicked out of the house. Um, so it's really important uh, considering this reality that teens are able to sort of um, understand if they're being monitored. And I, I'm not gonna say that kids shouldn't be, shouldn't be monitored at all because I don't think that that's a realistic goal to have, but I think that we can have the goal of it not being secret. Um, I think it needs to be more part of an open conversation and that if people are going to choose to use monitoring software on their kids' devices, there needs to be something in the user interface that makes it very clear that this is happening. And there are lots of lots of different um, softwares out there that parents use that do do this, that make it very clear and that there's no way that you can use it secretly. But there's also um, a lot of what's called stalkerware out there, which is uh, software that lets you do this completely secretly. And I know we have uh, at least one expert in the audience on this who maybe can talk about it afterwards. Um, but this is software that is completely secret. Um, it's usually sort of marketed as something that's for child safety and definitely some people do use it on their children's devices in order to track them secretly. Um, but it's also something that we know is a big issue with uh, domestic in a domestic violence context where abusers will put it on the device of a non-consenting adult and then that has huge safety implications. Um, so thinking about issues with surveillance, does the target of the surveillance know that they're being surveilled? And my thought on this is that they should always know so that they can understand that this is happening and they can make uh, decisions that will keep them safe. Thinking back to the LGBTQ plus kids who need to be able to sort of do this research um, in secret, or at least, you know, if they know they're being surveilled, then maybe they won't do it at all, or they'll, they'll stick to a friend's laptop or something like that. Um, and then have safeguards been put in place to ensure surveillance is not used against non-consenting adults, which like I was just saying, is a really big issue with stalkerware where people will put it on the devices of their spouses in, in order to sort of um, surveil them as well as track their location. Um, and there are, I talk about this in my book, but there are a few different domestic violence homicides that have been linked directly to stalkerware. 
um, because the person, you know, had no idea that their their current or former partner was watching them in this way. And then they saw that they were um, planning to leave um, or even just talking to a friend about the abuse. And then that ultimately led to their murder. And I want to talk about like really quickly that this comes up in all sorts of sneaky ways. So I talked about monitoring software and I talked about like home cameras and those are really obvious ways that surveillance happens, but there's all these sort of sneaky ways and it comes up like even something that has like a history log could ostensibly be used for surveillance. But um, really quickly, the Amazon Echo has this thing called the drop-in feature. Um, and this is a way that we've been hearing more and more people are surveilling each other. So for anyone who's not familiar, so this is the Amazon Echo device and you can set it up where certain contacts are able to um, drop in on you, which it's basically sort of the same as a telephone call, except the big difference is that you know, when you get a call on your phone, you see who's calling and you can accept or decline, whereas a drop-in call just starts. There is no um, consent to picking it up. And the idea is that, well, these are people from your contacts who you have given permission to do this, but it's not that simple in a domestic violence context um, when people may not have full control and autonomy over their devices and someone else might be setting things up in a way that uh, they can then surveil them, which is exactly what people are doing with devices like the Amazon Echo and the drop-in feature. Um, so I just want to give that example as a way that, you know, this shows up in all sorts of sneaky ways. And I think we have to be really vigilant about surveillance and um, resisting it as it becomes more and more normalized in our society. Okay, moving on. Erica has broken up with her abusive boyfriend, Dan, but suddenly Dan is everywhere she goes. She has turned all of her social media to private. She's not letting new followers in. Um, she's sort of looked at all the different guides online for how to keep yourself uh, safe digitally from being stalked. And she's doing all of these different things. Um, and she even moves out of her apartment early so that she can get into a new place that he doesn't know where she lives. Um, but he is still able to find her. Um, she, he's showing up um, outside of her workplace and she's terrified he's gonna find out where she lives now. She starts losing sleep and her performance at work suffers. Um, and she's just at her wit's end and doesn't know how he's finding her. So location data privacy is a really sensitive issue. Um, stalking statistics vary around the world, but it's like a very common thing. In the US, the statistic is that one in six women and one in 19 men will be stalked at some point in their lives. So thinking about things like, does your product make location data public to certain users? Um, is it clear to the user when and how their location data is visible to, other, to others? So um, you know, making sure that people have, um, have full control over how their, how their location data is seen and um, and that it's very clear because I've seen that sometimes when I'm looking at different apps, um, especially I, I'll, I'm very interested in like fitness apps because they often have a location element um, that can be used dangerously. And often the language that's used is not very clear. So it should be very clear to people how their location data is visible to others. And then there's privacy the default. Um, a lot of those uh, fitness apps will have like running routes or different things set to public by default and a user has to kind of go through and set it to private. And um, that's not, you know, they didn't actually consent to that. And I, um, I'll talk more about consent in a minute, but consent is like such a huge thing. And especially looking at settings when it comes to location data, making sure that you have gotten authentic consent to actually share someone's data in that way. Okay, so this is uh, the final story. Um, it's about Cecilia. This is actually an acquaintance of mine. Um, she's a designer in Norway and she did a really great conference talk about this called Next Level Stalkerware. Um, but her story is that, uh, so this is the before times when she was still working in an office before the pandemic. Uh, she left her office and went to a nearby grocery store and she bought some tea that she was planning on keeping in her office to drink at work. Uh, later that night she came home and her husband was rummaging around the kitchen and he said, hey, where's that nice tea that you bought earlier today? And it turned out that Tom had downloaded an account for a large Norwegian grocery store chain for their new app. 
um, and created an account with it. And it was basically just a way to see sort of all of his purchases in one place. Um, but it turned out that because the two of them had a shared bank account, it had automatically sort of added her purchases to his app and to his account. And he was able to see everything that she had bought. So this was an issue of assumed consent. It sort of seems like the grocery store app figured, well, you know, because she's consented to have this shared bank account with him, of course, she'll consent to just seeing, you know, the groceries that he buys and that he'll be able to see the groceries she buys. Like, why would that be a problem? Uh, but they had never actually gotten her consent for her data to be used in his app. Um, and while this was safe for Cecilia, you know, she was in a safe relationship and her husband hadn't, he hadn't even tried to do this. He wasn't trying to surveil her in this way. It was just sort of given to him. Um, it's very clear how an abuser would be able to make use of this for very dangerous things. Um, first of all, there are lots of sensitive items that you can buy in a grocery store. So things like pregnancy tests, as well as um, plan B, which is the morning after contraceptive. Um, there's also things like magazines of different content and going back to, you know, a teenager whose parents are uh, homophobic, a teenager who buys something with LGBTQ plus content could also be in danger from an app like this. Um, it also showed the uh, location of the store as well as a timestamp of when Cecilia had made her purchase. And going back to the location data issue, this is also a very big concern because it could give someone information about the location and shopping habits of someone who has left the relationship. So thinking about issues with consent, um, I really think we should be borrowing everything basically from the anti-sexual assault practice. So um, thinking about a product getting authentic consent for user settings, certain features, promotional material, you know, um, having something set to default, like your location data being public and having to go through a series of steps in order to um, change that is not authentic consent. Uh, same with having a box checked for opting into a promotional email um, and saying, well, they'll just uncheck it if they don't want it. That is not authentic consent. And thinking about, you know, best practices for healthy sex, we would never kind of say that it's okay to sort of um, not be very clear about what you want to do and get consent for that. And then, you know, you have consent for other things that you weren't clear about. And then getting consent regularly. Um, so thinking about things like Google Maps, where you're able to share your location with someone. Um, this is a big issue in a domestic violence context where people will, um, you know, just sort of take their victim's phone and share the, con share the location with themselves. Um, and then, you know, the, the product never like checks back in, it never gets consent again. So someone can have their location shared with someone else for years uh, and their consent is never sort of re-gotten. They just assume that consent for something in the past equals consent to something in the present, which again, looking at best practices for healthy sex, we know is not a good way to think about consent. Um, and then thinking about, does your product assume that consent to one product equals consent to another, which is what we just saw um, with the example of Cecilia. Um, and of course, we would never say that consenting to one sex act um, means you are consenting to a different one. And we should have that sort of same line of thinking with our tech. Okay, so those are all the stories. Um, there is one more thing I wanna talk about before getting into uh, integrating designing for safety into uh, actual uh, technology work. Um, and that's the domestic violence security threat model. So this is basically the idea that passwords don't always keep things private and that owning a device doesn't keep others from using it because in a domestic violence context, abusers can simply demand passwords using violence or threats of violence. Um, and this is a very different sort of threat model from what security professionals are usually thinking about. You know, they're usually thinking about anonymous bad actors, um, people who wanna sort of like get into a big database and, and leak a bunch of data or things like phishing attempts where they're trying, where they're sending a bunch of emails and you know, hoping someone is gonna click a link. Um, this is a very different sort of idea that the most dangerous person might actually be someone who lives with you. Um, and it's really important that we, that we kind of think about these things. So going back to the Google Maps um, example, uh, I think you know, the original designers would probably never have guessed that someone would use this in a nefarious way. Um, because you know, it's on your device, you have a password, only you have access to that app, but that's actually not true. 
Um, and this is why it's really important to think about things like getting consent again later, because you know maybe the abuser has just like deleted a notification that came up. Um, so we have to kind of think think about different ways around the fact that um, people don't always have full control over their device and that passwords aren't necessarily keeping their devices and their accounts secret. So how can we kind of live within that reality and do other things that are gonna keep our users safe despite those facts? Okay, I'm gonna talk really quickly for just a few minutes about integrating design, designing for safety into your work. And I know this might not be super applicable for everyone. Um, this is the part um, of my, my book that's very much focused on like the practicalities for working technologists. So apologies if this isn't relevant to you. Um, but this is the process for inclusive safety that I uh, created that's basically sort of just a accumulation of my different activities that I made um, to so sort of get at designing for safety. Um, and the way this is meant to work is it's supposed, it's it kind of meant to like fit over the sort of general design process where you like do research, um, you define the problem, you make solutions, and then you test those solutions out. This can kind of just be fit on top of it. Um, and then none of these things is especially time consuming. And uh, I have little time estimates here, uh, which I think is really useful in terms of being able to give your your client or your stakeholder, your boss, whoever, an estimate and like a specific time frame that they're uh, gonna say yes to. So you might say like, uh, we've already done the research and we need to do these four things and it's gonna take this many hours. It's really just more about like making the time to do this and setting aside like an afternoon every week for the next few weeks where you, where you think about this stuff. So first, um, the first step is research into existing, you know, the academic literature that's out there on these topics, which there's a lot of thanks to people like Leonie and the STEEP program, um, doing research uh, into academic literature as well as just like news articles in ways that similar products have been weaponized for harm. And then using that information to create archetypes. Um, so if people are familiar with personas, this is kind of a similar thing, but it's basically um, defining an abuser and defining a survivor and defining sort of what the issue is and what their goals are. So for example, using a fitness app, the abuser's goal would be he wants to find his ex-girlfriend. Uh, he wants to be able to figure out anything he can about her, her location using this app that he knows that she uses because she's a big runner. And then her goal, the survivor's goal, is to be able to use this app without any of her location data getting back to her ex. And then there's uh, some time for brainstorming novel abuse cases. So, you know, you've done the research. Um, there's all these things that are already out there in the world, or maybe there's, there's not that much that's out there. Um, but you have your archetypes and you kind of use these things to think of, okay, so what's like, what's brand new stuff that could go wrong with this product that isn't already out there in the world but that could totally happen. So just taking time to think through that. And then there's solutioning for ways uh, to either prevent or mitigate the different abuse cases that you've identified um, and then testing it out to make sure that it actually works and sort of going through the, the cycle of, you know, finding out that something in the testing reveals that it's, you know, something's not perfect. So then you go back to the solutions, create a better solution, test it out and just kind of keep going in the cycle. Um, so with the stalking, the X uh, archetypes, you know, you would test the product to make sure that there's no kind of location data available for someone who has set everything to private. Um, and, you know, if you find that actually there is something available, then you go back to the solutions and think like, how can we make sure that actually this user understands that they need to like turn off the certain feature or whatever it is that's letting the location data get out. Cool, and there's um, there's an entire chapter in my book dedicated to this process. This is just a really quick overview and kind of going back to the checkbox framework um, concept, I wanna talk about just really quickly that this um, process is gonna be much better if you've sort of got this foundation of, of how this works, of how people weaponize tech for harm to sort of, Put it all on top of um, and that you're going to get a lot more out of sort of doing these different activities um, if you've got this like mental model of, of sort of a few different dozen ways of how people 
help people do this and help people weaponize tech for harm and uh, use it for their abusive goals. Um, and now we can go into questions. I think, yes, about 45 minutes. So I will um, stop sharing my screen. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, if I thank you so, so much, that was fantastic. And I know from the names in the audience that I'm sure it resonated a lot with the people that are here today. And hopefully for those that are new to the topic, it gave a lot of stimulating thought. It was certainly something that was came, coming up in the um, chat function today. And we have already four really interesting questions uh, that I think it would be great to perhaps answer uh, uh, live in the chat today. Um, if, if it's okay, should we start with Julia's question? She was asking, uh, in your view, how much of is this a problem is due to the lack of awareness among developers versus a lack of financial or other incentive to just properly design for safety rather than engagement and other things? Yeah, okay. Sorry, just open the Q&A. How much yeah. of this is due to a lack of awareness of developers versus a lack of financial or other incentive? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. I feel like um, what you're sort of getting at is like, um, the sort of difference between like individuals and teams doing this work and then like having some sort of like government regulation or um yeah some sort of like incentive for companies to actually and for sorry the people who lead companies i'm trying to be intentional about not saying like companies like because what is it like i'm trying to say like people who lead companies should ultimately ultimately be like responsible for making sure that their products aren't used for harm um, or like quickly course correcting. Um, so I, but I feel like it's both, like it's both people not being aware. Cause usually when I have, you know, I've been doing this work for a few years and the biggest thing people will say is that they just had like no idea that this was happening and now they're aware of it and they're going to like think more about it. Um, but then I think that, yes, it's like that, but it's, it is also the fact that like, we're just allowed to kind of like do what we want right now. There's no you know, you look at like Facebook and they've done so much harm, like every year there's like a new big scandal and they, they haven't, there's like, I think there's been one lawsuit that has like forced like a tiny amount of change, um, but there's no like the government isn't holding them accountable. They certainly aren't like self-regulating in any meaningful way. Um, so definitely like the average like product company or consultancy or agency has no reason. There's like no, yeah, like financial incentive other than just, it's just people wanting to do the right thing um that's like making change so but it's so i think it's definitely both we need both things the second question is from sierra shell and it's about surveillance and safety um and you know uh is surveillance with informed consent less harmful than hidden surveillance and um the person that gives an example with regards to the supermarket informs customers that they have cctv upon entering um and theoretically someone can choose not to enter uh because it was in they were informed about this but is that then really consent and is there also is it also too late for a surveillance free existence oh man big questions sierra this is good stuff um uh, so i feel like it's not too late but like yeah it's like it's really bad um and i think i think like one of the things that we can do is just like really push against the normalization of this because it is just like, yeah, it's just become such a normal thing. And you're right that it's like, it, it's not, it's a, it's pretty disingenuous to say like, oh, well, if you don't wanna be seen on the camera, then don't shop at that grocery store. Like that's not, that's like a pretty crappy like answer to this whole question um, as if like you have the choice and um, you know, certain places, maybe that's your only grocery store or as if you, you should have to like think about this when you're buying groceries. Um, I feel like there was another part of the question. Um, is it too late? Oh, is it more harmful? Um, yes. It's, so I think secret surveillance is more harmful than when the user knows about it. Um, specifically thinking about like the really, you know, intense stories of like the person who like in Florida, who was, you know, doing safety planning where she was like texting her friend about like staying at her place when she left her abusive husband and he saw that and then that was like the impetus where he, you know, finally turned his violence like up a level and ended up murdering her. 
So there's things like that, um, where if she knew that she was being watched, she could have like, you know, taken steps to keep herself safe in that situation. Um, but I also, I, I honestly don't feel like, um, fighting against all sort of forms of surveillance is a realistic goal, at least right now. I feel like, I feel like, you know, there's the coalition against stalkerware and like these different groups working on the issues of stalkerware, um, which is like the secret version of it. And that hopefully we're going to make progress on that. And I almost feel like once that's illegal and like people are actually held accountable to the harm that's been done with that, then maybe, you know, we can like shift and like, look at like, okay, now that now that that's taken care of, like, let's talk about these other things. But I feel like that's the sort of like big, big thing now that we're tackling. Um, the other question is from Murray. Um, are there not affordances that are multivalent when it comes to uh, fostering or protecting against abuse? For example, an audit law could reveal a user content gaslighting someone, but in a different context, such logs could be useful to uh to further monitor victims so the dual use question yes um i actually talk about this in my book because this is such a real thing like trying to weigh like um uh yeah like the the benefits of giving more data but then is that just going to be like another way that you can kind of like surveil someone um i don't really think there's like an easy answer to this i feel like you kind of have to like look at each individual thing and and try to like weigh out the pros and cons. I feel like um, having having the the data so in this specific thing like having the data log um, and then making it like having like doing everything you can to make sure that the user knows that this is there. So again like this form of surveillance so that it's not secret so that they know that like you know maybe their abuser is going to see that they um, you know, we're actually like home and turned up the heat when they said they were gone or whatever it is that they know that this is going to be a thing. Um, but like, yeah, I feel like it's, it's really tough. And there aren't, there isn't like a, just a one easy one size fits all and every, every different product sort of has to be weighed individually. The next question is uh, from Kane Chan. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Um, so the question is, so typically no one product or feature gets published without many people seeing it. So product owners, developers, designers, QA, et cetera, and questioning its, its integrity. It seems to me that there is a partly going to be a big challenge around education and awareness, i.e. there's no intentionality. In your experience working with other clients, what is an effective approach to introducing these intentionalities? Yeah, so yeah, you're so right that like, a ton of different people see this and that there isn't often a lot of intentionality around bringing bringing up these safety issues and again this is something i have a couple different sort of notes in my book about this exact thing about like helping like how to start the conversation at your workplace and how to talk to people who are sort of resistant or might say like oh you know that's just an edge case or like it's not very common we don't have to worry about that um but I think, yeah, there has to be like someone who brings it up um, and like takes that on. One of the things that I think is really helpful with that is like getting allies at your workplace so that it's not just you like awkward because it's mostly just awkward to like bring this stuff up. Like it's scary and then you do it and then it's just really awkward and people just stare at you and are like, what? Like, do we really have to talk about that? And it feels very weird. Um, so I think like having a friend already in the room who's gonna be on board and is gonna be like, yeah, we totally need to talk about this is really important. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is like a big part of my work and like why I do presentations like this and wrote my book is to try to get that education and awareness out there. Um, so yeah, hopefully you're on board with it now and and can help, help with it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I hope that like everyone who joined today was keen on being educated around that. Um, brilliant. The other question is from uh, Adiola. Uh, have you seen in your work a possible need to redefine privacy or a renewed understanding of privacy given the different contexts highlighted in your presentations? Really interesting question. Yeah, um, I, I definitely think so, um, especially I feel like, yeah, so much of this kind of like what I was talking about with security, like 
and privacy is very similar where we think about like most of the sort of like content out there, like news articles and things that people are talking about are very focused on sort of like privacy in terms of like a big data standpoint, um, like keeping your, like your, you know, you want to keep things private and then, you know, seeing how it impacts like your, um, like the ads you get, for example, or different, different things like that, that are much more like anonymous happening in this like nebulous context that at least like, I don't really understand, you know, how all that stuff works, but that's what we're, that's usually, you know, articles and different things in the media are, that's what they're thinking about in terms of privacy. And I think we do need to redefine privacy um, and like expand it to include this sort of more like interpersonal way of thinking about it, which is um, not something people have been very keen to do because it's it's a lot trickier and more complicated to think about like privacy from your, your husband or your wife who is actually like very abusive. Um, so yeah, I, th I think an expanded version of privacy would be really good and is very important. And the last question that was posted so far with um, the Shout out to everyone who has any final pressing questions to post them now, because we still have five minutes left, but uh, you know, that would be your one-off opportunity. Uh, well, actually, I'm sure people can get in touch with you as well. Um, but the Lewis uh, was asking, what journals are best for IoT and gender papers? I guess that's kind of very niche, but like, I don't know if you, if you. You know, honestly, can I kick this over to you, Leonie? Because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not in this space. Um, so I've definitely like got a lot of like favorite sort of like studies and articles and different things that I'll reference, but um, I don't have like so one thing that I look at regularly. You do have in, in your, uh, perhaps for, for Louis in the book uh, that uh, there's also a long list of like resources that you're sharing with. So I don't know if you wanna. Yeah, yeah, actually, um, yes, I have that in my book. And then I also have it on inclusivesafety.com. There's, I'll just put it in the chat right now. There's. Um, let me make sure that this is the right link before I do that. But I have a list of that, like it's basically the same list of resources um, that's in there. Um, yeah, sorry, I wasn't thinking about things that aren't journals, but there are lots of things. Okay. And Louis, if, it, if it's specifically of academic journals, um, I mean, there's a breadth of uh, different outlets you can go to domestic abuse journals like Violence Against Women or Journal of Gender-Based Violence. And if you go more into the kind of HCI, human computer interactions, there's tons of things like at CHI, uh, which is CHI written down, which is a conference to the Journal of Cybersecurity. So it's it really depends what route you want to go down. But um, I'm sure not just journals are the best outlet to look for these topics, but like the list that um, Eva just gave as well. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of different types of resources on there because um, this is also just such a like huge space. Um, so there's like any one of these topics I covered, you could do a deep dive and find all sorts of different resources. But hopefully, that list I just put in the chat will be a good starting point. We have four more minutes. Um, again, like a last shout out for anyone to post any questions. But before, if if there's none so far, I just want to um, ask you, Eva, from um, you know this. Like, I, I really wonder how you as a, as a researcher, as a practitioner, as a, as a designer, how are you dealing actually from your perspective on a day-to-day -day with the kind of secondary trauma or the challenges that researching or working in this topic actually uh, uh, like uh, results in? Like, I, I wonder how, how you're managing that. Yeah, oh, thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, that's super real because um, it's dark stuff to like engage with every day and I've actually found that I have to just take breaks for days or sometimes like weeks at a time where I don't like read any articles I don't open like I have all my different um google alerts for different terms and I don't look at any of those um and yeah basically taking long breaks and then also therapy for people who have access um has been really key um yeah those are my two big things and I just got a kitten and she helps. Oh. Um, so like having a pet to snuggle um, is literally what I do when things get like really sad. And I read a particularly rough story. I close my laptop and go hang out with my pets. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's what I've got. I guess we're all going off buying puppies and kittens now. Yeah. <laughs>
Oh, and uh, Sierra is just asking what's the name of the kitten. Uh, her name is Reptar. Wow. Um, it's a reference to a kid's show called The Rugrats. Um, there's like a T-Rex character named Reptar. Um, yeah, I thought it would be a good name for like a little kitten. Thanks, Mari. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, well, um, if there's no further questions, then um, I really want to say a big, big thank you to you, Eva, for, for taking the time, presenting your work, talking about your new book, and, and also the, the design safety work you're doing. Uh, I'm sure uh, everyone uh, joins me in a digital round of applause. I know these are not very satisfying in the Zoom environment, but really, I, I'm sure everybody is extremely thankful for your input and your uh, work in this space. And for everyone who's just who's jo had joined us um please feel free to check out eva's work i shared like her website the link to the book uh in the chat so do give it a read it's it's really um great to have a, finally a book a publication uh, not just a journal article but like something very physical uh, out there and i think it has a lot of like super relevant um pointers both for practitioners researchers or anyone policy officials or tech designers interested in that space and yeah i just want to hand over with the last if you want to have the last word, Eva. Oh, just thanks so much for having me. This was really great. Um, I really appreciate all the all the thoughtful questions. So thanks everyone. Brilliant. Well, with that, uh, the webinar is officially closed, nearly on time. We have probably a few seconds left. So everyone have a wonderful morning, afternoon, wherever you are. And again, check out Eva's work and uh, hopefully see you soon, eventually in real life at a conference, yes, at an hopefully. event. Hopefully. <laughs> So thank you, everyone. And thank you. See you soon. Bye.